up on global business, Chinese President Xi Jinping emphasizes innovation and development during inspection of Nining in Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. China's economy maintains strong growth in November, fueled by robust production and consumer demand. Chinese branded coffee shops outnumber U.S. chains, reflecting changing consumer preferences. Hello and welcome to Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Michelle Vandenberg. Chinese President Xi Jinping says whether China and the U.S. can work together to tackle challenges concerns the interests of the two peoples and the future of humanity. Xi Jinping made the remarks in a congratulatory letter to mark the 50th anniversary of the U.S.-China Business Council. She says the past 50 years have witnessed the persistent and point pursue, joint pursuit of bilateral partnership and mutual benefit, despite twists and turns. He says China is ready to make concerted efforts with the U.S. to promote healthy, stable and sustainable development of bilateral ties. The Chinese president also says China will remain committed to fostering a market-oriented, law-based and world-class business environment. And he believes Chinese modernization will provide more opportunities for businesses from both the U.S. and other countries. Chinese President Xi Jinping has inspected southern China's Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region and listened to the work report of the region's party committee and government. She affirmed Guangxi's achievements and highlighted the need for high-quality development. She stressed the importance of strengthening industries focusing on those with regional advantages and emphasized integrating scientific, educational and industrial innovations. She urged the development of key industries like marine economy and port-related sectors and the promotion of green transformation in industrial structures. Earlier in the week, President Xi inspected cities in the region. On Thursday, he visited the China ASEAN Information Harbor Company in the regional capital Nanning. He was briefed on the trade and economic ties with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and the development and application of information informatization. He also visited an agricultural industrial park and a sugar company in the city of Lai Bin. He inspected sugarcane production, planting and harvesting, as well as the development of the sugar industry. Now for more insights on President Xi's visit to the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, let's bring in Chen Jiahe, Chief Investment Officer at Novum RK Technologies. Jiahe, good to see you. So what economic impacts uh, do you expect President Xi's visit to have on Guangxi and uh, which sectors do you anticipate experiencing significant growth um, in the region in the future? Well, currently the economy of Guangxi is growing at a faster speed compared with the national average. And this visiting can surely bring more confidence to the local economic growth and actually more expectation to the growing of local components, individual income, etc. If we get a map of China, we can see that the location of Guangxi province is very critical. It is right next to Guangdong area, which includes cities like Hong Kong and Shenzhen. And it is also next to Vietnam, as well as having the port that is facing the South China Sea which means it has also got a close connection with the ASEAN countries. Uh, meanwhile, in its north there stands the large provinces of Guizhou, Yunnan and Hunan, uh, which are three large and populated provinces. So Guangxi in, is in this quite critical location. And looking into the future, there are many important areas for it to grow. For example, the trade between Guangxi and the ASEAN economies, the local agriculture, the local consumption market includes the tourism market, which which is very famous in China, as well as its domestic trade with other provinces. Um, there are many shining points for the Guangxi province in the future. And what are some of the potential economic outcomes of Guangxi's efforts towards modernizing its agriculture sector, and how might these initiatives influence both domestic and international markets? Historically speaking, Guangxi is an important hub for China's agriculture as well as the growing of Chinese medicine, uh, thanks to its warm and wet weather and its vast layout of land and hills. Uh, but for once in a while, due to the lacking of modern technology as well as the remote location to the center of China, the income of Guangxi farmers uh, was not high. 
But now with the input of more agricultural equipment and technology, this is changing. The productivity of farmers is rising every single year. And this means more income for themselves and for the economies around the Guangxi province. This has also got a big advantage. The Guangdong province, for example, is a large consumer of agricultural products. And the ASEAN countries also have a, a strong trading relationship with Guangxi. So a more developed agricultural industry in Guangxi actually brings much more economic benefits to all these economies. Yeah. And what, in what ways do you anticipate uh, President Xi's visit will enhance Guangxi's economic connections with ASEAN countries? And what implications might this have on the broader regional economic landscape? Well, the economic growth of Guangxi is actually strongly linked with the growing of ASEAN uh, countries. If we look at the economic development level of these two economic zones, uh, most of parts of them are developing economies and are growing at rapid speed. So this means there are way more opportunities for these economies. Uh, currently, China is putting a lot of effort to boost the trade between coastal provinces and ASEAN countries. For Guangxi province, one of the recent large investment projects has been the Pinglu Canal, where around 70 billion RMB will be invested in order to improve the canal system in Guangxi province. And a more railroad is also being constructed. All these efforts made will strongly boost the trading relationship between Guangxi and ASEAN countries and bring economic growth for both regions. Yeah, thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciate your time. Always great to have you on the show. Chen Jiahe, Chief Investment Officer of Novum RK Technologies. Official data released on Friday shows China's economy maintained a steady recovery in November with increased output and consumer spending. Zheng Chunying has more from Beijing. China's National Bureau of Statistics says industrial production improved in November, expanding 6.6 percent from a year earlier, up from a 2 percent increase in July. In terms of sectors, the value added in mining increased by 3.9 percent year on year. Manufacturing went up by 6.7 percent. The production and supply of electricity, thermal power, gas and water grew by 9.9 percent. Retail sales, a key metric for domestic consumption, rose by 10.1 percent in November year-on-year, year, up from the 7.6 percent growth in October. And the property sector faces a range of challenges, with real estate investment falling by 9.4 percent in the first 11 months compared with a year earlier. But officials say they are positive about the sector's outlook in the coming year. With more support policies implemented, we have already witnessed signs of improvement in the property sector. Next, we will continue to expedite the development of a new real estate model, and we are confident the housing sector will be stabilized in the near future. Officials also say imports and exports saw a 1.2 percent increase year-on-year in November, up by 0.3 percentage points compared to the previous month. And China continues to implement measures designed to improve the country's trade structure. Official data shows November saw fast growth in high-tech investment and employment remained generally stable. Officials also say that China's economy still faces some challenges, including insufficient demand, overcapacity in certain industries, as well as the complicated international political and economic situation. But they said that they're confident that these will be addressed through the implementation of more effective measures following the general principle of the Central Economic Work Conference held this week. Cheng Chuying, CGTN, Beijing. Latest data from the National Bureau of Statistics shows that new home prices in China declined in November. This was observed in 70 major cities where both new and second-hand home prices decreased on a monthly basis. In first-year cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou and Shenzhen, new home prices slightly dropped by 0.3 percent compared to the previous month. Among these cities, Guangzhou witnessed the largest decline of 0.9 percent, while Shanghai saw a modest increase of 0.6 percent. In second tier and third tier cities, new home prices fell 0.3 percent and 0.4 percent, respectively. The price of pre-owned homes in the first tier cities also faced a decline, with prices dropping by 1.4 percent. China unveiled its national budget for the first 11 months of this year on Friday. The National General Public Budget reported a 7.9 percent year-on-year increase in revenue to 20 trillion yuan or 2.8 trillion U.S. dollars. Of this total, tax revenue accounted for 17 trillion yuan, marking a substantial growth of 10.2 percent from the previous year. 
Conversely, non-tax revenue recorded a slight decline of 3% year-on-year, amounting to 3 trillion yuan. Alongside this, the cumulative general public spending across the nation reached 24 trillion yuan, reflecting a 4.9% increase from the same period last year. During the recently concluded Central Economic Work Conference, there was a call to achieve progress while maintaining stability and to implement new measures while phasing out old ones. Hong Hao, the chief economist, economist of Grow Investment Group elaborated on this new objective and shared his analysis of the conference outcomes. The Central Economic Work Conference had a couple of highlights. One of them is a new term in Chinese we call it Xian Li Hou Po, which literally means we fix it and then break it. How do you interpret these new terms? Um, yeah, it, it is a new term. Um, you know, normally uh, in Chinese uh, we say you know we break it first and then fix it, right? So you know we 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 break the existing uh, model first and then we'll, f we'll fix it and then we drink it. Uh, so you know this time around, you know we're, we're talking we're talking about you know steady the ship first and then uh, uh, develop. Uh, so I think stability is the key. Uh, I think the uh, management is trying to uh, keep a stable, steady. Uh, domestic environment uh, for uh, for the economic uh, re-engineering process. Have you seen any progress made from the conference? This year, we're seeing um, new messages coming out of this meeting. Uh, for example, you know we're going to use a new technology development uh, to develop new types of productivity and to propel economic growth going forward. And back then, I think you know last year, for example, you know we we are emphasizing Emphasizing on uh, boosting domestic demand to uh, to help the ec economy to recover. But I think going forward, uh, you know, that is still important, you know, because that is also being discussed uh, in the conference as, as well. But the role of te technological development uh, is uh, becoming increasingly more important. Uh, so, and this I think is the first time that you know we're putting uh, science and technology development, you know, in the center. Uh, of uh, economic uh, growth model going forward. What do you think is the dominant trend for the overall economic growth in China this year? The Chinese economy is uh, going into a new phase. Uh, it's trying to switch away from uh, a growth model that is driven by property investment growth uh, and going into a high-tech manu manufacturing uh, driven growth. Property sector is important, but it shouldn't be one and only uh, sector that matters to the Chinese uh, uh, economy and also, you know, in a new environment where uh, uh, rivalry between countries is starting to heating up uh, in terms of, you know, who, you know, gets to take the lead uh, or even dominate the tech sector, uh, that is probably the the crucial success, the crucial uh, battle that you know China has to has to win. Uh, obviously, uh, this year we've seen some initial attempts and end results already. You know, the GDP. Uh, coming from the property sector uh, in terms of percentage has decreased substantially. But at the same time, uh, investment in other areas and also some new and emerging uh, industries are uh, developing substantially faster than the traditional industries. I would say that you know this year, uh, you know people are starting to see and feel um, the uh, the change of the uh, development model. I'm just hoping that you know going forward, you know, more and more people will come around to this camp uh, and, you know, see property as part of the, uh, sort of a part of the necessary, the, the, the consumer uh, discretionary sector uh, that is helping, you know, consumption, while, you know, the investment that used to be set aside, invested in the property sector, you know, will be being used to uh, uh, develop the high-tech uh, sector uh, and the manufacturing sector uh, of the Chinese economy. Will this trend, which you refer to as a restructuring process, continue in the year to come? Will we be able to see some effects from the change? As time goes by, you're seeing uh, the embryo of, of the new de uh, development structure uh, clearer and clearer, while the, uh, the old uh, development model is sort of receding uh, into the background. And I think that it's probably more uh, uh, likely that we're going to see an experience in the in the next couple of years, and China is developing a very uh, substantial comparative advantage relative to the other nations. You know, for example, the EV sectors. Right? So China now is the largest EV exporter of the world, 
et cetera, et cetera. So things are gradually changing, you know, uh, and, and, and it's an emerging process that we need to manage well. Uh, but obviously, you know, we are feeling uh, uh, more and more palpable, you know, the change that is coming our way. Now we are uh, at about 300% uh, uh, to GDP uh, debt to leverage ratio, uh, and that has to be changed. I think this year, you know, we're probably going to see, uh, for example, you know, restructuring of uh, local government debt, uh, also more assistance for real estate developers who may have short-term cash flow problems. You know, there are many things to do, but one has to keep in mind that solving the real estate uh, challenge and also uh, solving the local government bond uh, issues, uh, it's, it's a long-term issue. We probably took more than a decade to get to where we are now and probably take you know, at least a couple of years to clean it up. You're watching Global Business, still to come. Chinese branded coffee shops outnumber U.S. chains, reflecting changing consumer preferences. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. China now has more branded coffee shops than the United States. Our Li Jianhua looks at the reasons for the rising demand for a caffeine kick. Everybody knows that China is traditionally a tea drinking country. But how about coffee? Is this as popular in China as it is elsewhere in the world? Starbucks dominates the world's coffee market, but in China, a new brand recently knocked them off the top spot. And their success says a lot about coffee culture in China. Starbucks operates over 6,500 stores in China. Luckin Coffee, a homegrown brand founded in 2017, overtook Starbucks in June 2023 and became the largest coffee chain in China with 10,000 stores. But wait! In June 2020, Luckin was delisted from the Nasdaq because of accounting fraud, for which the company had to pay a penalty of 180 million US dollars. So how did the tables turn and how did Luckin manage to capture China's heart? First, who drinks coffee in China? The earliest coffee house in record was set up in 1836 by a Danish person in southern China's Guangzhou. It was called by the Chinese then as a black wine. But it was only when millennials and later Gen Z became the main consuming group that coffee, especially freshly ground coffee, became a leading beverage. Coffee's market value is expected to exceed 30 billion US dollars by 2025. And Luckin is dominating that market with cheap, innovative and fun products, mainly appealing to Gen Z. 80% of coffee drinkers are aged between 20 and 35, and they either drink it to wake up or to socialize with friends. Unlike Starbucks, which provides a cozy and comfortable environment to sit and chat, Luckin's stores are usually quite small and are more... Here we go, grab and go. Coffee culture has also embraced the digitalization. Consumers order from mobile apps so that drinks are ready when they arrive and they can also get them delivered to their workplace. And you can get your coffee anywhere at any time. The Chinese market's love of innovation has embraced Luckin's co-branding partnerships. In September, the company introduced a liquor-flavored latte together with China's most high-end alcohol brand, Maotai. That has captured many young Chinese commuters' hearts. On launch day, over 5 million cups were sold, and that single-day turnover exceeded $13 million. Can they stay on top? Well, who knows? In the lightning speed of change in the Chinese consumer market, you always need to stay ahead of the game. The market for coffee shops in China has boomed. 
There are now more branded coffee outlets than any other country in the world. The number has grown to nearly 50,000, 60% more than last year. The growth was led by a rapid expansion of small stores and delivery-focused brands like Luckin Coffee, which reported a net increase of more than 5,000 stores, and Coddy Coffee with an additional 6,000. Starbucks had over 70, 780 more outlets and has the second largest total in the country. China is the fastest growing market in East Asia, ahead of Malaysia and the Philippines. Electric vehicle maker Tesla is issuing a recall for nearly all of its cars in the U.S. to address concerns related to the use of its autopilot feature. The recall comes after a review of approximately a thousand crashes involving the feature. For more on what this means for consumers and the future of self-driving cars, Mark New has the latest from the Silicon Valley. The safety recall involving the autopilot feature will affect nearly all of the 2 million Tesla vehicles on the road. While there are some serious safety concerns, let me put this recall into perspective. It's not a recall where owners will actually need to take their car in to fix a part or get something installed, but rather it's an over-the-air update, essentially a software download. The U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration issued the recall after a two-year probe into a series of accidents that occurred while the autopilot feature was activated. Some of the cases involved fatalities. The recall includes the Tesla Model X, S, Y and 3s up through the year 2023. The NHTSA says in certain circumstances when auto steer is engaged and the driver does not maintain responsibility for vehicle operation and is unprepared to intervene as necessary or fails to recognize when auto steer is canceled or not engaged, there may be an increased risk of a crash. The overall concern is that the autopilot system can give drivers a false sense of security and be prone to misuse in some dangerous situations. According to recall documents, the fix will incorporate additional controls and alerts to encourage the driver to adhere to continuous driving responsibility whenever auto steer is engaged. That may include keeping hands on the steering wheel and paying attention to the roadway. It may even suspend drivers from auto steer if they repeatedly fail to demonstrate responsibility. It's been an up and down year for self-driving car technology. Earlier this year, San Francisco became the first major U.S. city to have two robo-taxi self-driving car services for paying customers. That's Cruise and Waymo. But due to an incident um, where a cruise vehicle dragged a pedestrian six meters, California suspended the company's permits. Cruise's CEO eventually resigned, and on Thursday, Cruise announced it was laying off a quarter of its workforce. Now, in this recall, Tesla did not actually concur with the safety agency's analysis, but ultimately decided uh, to voluntarily administer a recall to resolve the investigation. Mark New, CGTN, Palo Alto, California. Now let's take a look at some other headlines from around the world. General Motors said on Thursday it will lay off 1,300 workers at two auto factories in Michigan starting in early January. As a part of the adjustment in production, employees at one of the plants will be presented with new job opportunities. Chinese electric vehicle manufacturer NIO said on Friday that it will introduce its more affordable Firefly brand in Europe in 2024, a year earlier than planned. Additionally, NIO will launch another cost-effective brand called Alps, potentially after 2025. Airbus is currently engaged in advanced discussions with the Atos, an IT consulting firm regarding the acquisition of its cybersecurity division, BDS. The BDS acquisition will enhance Airbus' position in the defense industry, which is increasingly focused on software. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. As one of China's earliest pioneers in exploring overseas markets and one of the most representative enterprises in international operations, 
SOEs like China Communications uh, Construction Company, or CCCC, have actively contributed to the high-quality development of the BRI. On Friday, during a press conference to com commemorate the 10th anniversary of the BRI, some diplomats stationed in China and foreign business representatives shared their experiences during the event. Pakistan and China forged the signature project of BRI a decade ago in the form of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Today, this corridor represents a success story of laying an enduring foundation for economic growth, livelihoods, and much more. It has successfully forged connectivity, infrastructure, and above all, spurred people-centered development. Within this transformative journey lies the Karakoram Highway Phase Two project particularly the Avelia Thakur section. Going forward, Pakistan remains resolute in forging deeper ties with China Communications Construction Company, propelling the success of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor even further. I would like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank the CCCC and especially the China Harbor Engineering for the tremendous work that they did and keep doing in South Sudan to meet the efforts of our government to develop our country. One of these important projects is the reconstruction of our international airport, Cuba International Airport, and again, the completion of uh, ATM project, which is the air traffic management project, which is completed two months ago, uh, making South Sudan having one of the advanced air traffic management system in the region, not because South Sudan is the best, but because we have started from where the other close countries is solved. I work also in the fourth bridge project over the Panama Canal as the director of the commercial and legal department. Uh, so this is a very important project for my country because it's a project that is connecting two sides of the country, the east and the west, and it reminds me a lot about the Belt and Road Initiative because it's all about connectivity, improving the life of people, the, the, the improvement of the environment and the quality of life. So for me, it's an immense uh, pleasure to be able to work with China Harbor in Panama, where it's building this important project that after the Panama Canal is the second largest and most important project for us. And it's going to change my country in all aspects, uh, even environmentally speaking, because less traffic, better environment. And that will do it for this edition of Global Business. I'm John Vandenberg in Beijing. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.